Good morning, everyone. My name is John Garbutt. I'm a principal engineer at Rackspace. I'm the current Nova PTL. I was also Nova PTL for the Liberty Cycle. Um, if you want to get in contact, my IRC name and Twitter handle is at John the Tuba Guy. So today this talk is about the friction between upstream priorities and internal priorities. And when preparing this, I think it all boils down to one particular question, which is you've been busy working away, you've installed OpenStack, you're using it, and yeah, it's not quite a wood tool workshop, but still, you're busy working away, and you come up with a great idea. You're like, this is fantastic. How do I get this upstream? There's lots of talks talking about why you want to get upstream. I'm just going to concentrate on how you start taking that idea and communicating it with the upstream community. Before I delve into that, I wanted to start with talking about why I'm here talking to you about getting ideas upstream into the community and share some of the experiences I've had doing this over my time. So my first sort of experience with OpenStack, where I started with OpenStack, was back in December 2010. I was working at Citrix. I just moved to the sort of cloud research group. And we were like, well, let's try this OpenStack thing. Let's see what it does and play around with it. Um, there's these Rackspace folks trying to use NServer and OpenStack. This will be fun. We should have a look. And we looked at, like, what can we do with this? And we thought, well, everyone else seems to be making a private cloud package or talking about it, so let's do that. That sounds cool. So we created this Project Olympus, and we were building this private cloud packaging using Puppet and all sorts of different bits and pieces. We had, like, nice in-jokes, like we'd come up with this idea of Pinocchio. So we thought, well, clearly, the puppet master has to be called Geppetto, because that's Pinocchio's dad. So we're like, sorted. We've got a product. We're fine. Um, things changed. We sort of got things working. This is my, my sort of experience as a taking OpenStack as a consumer and packaging it and that, that kind of thing. But the experience sort of changed because uh, Citrix acquired CloudStack. So being adaptable as I am, I thought, well, I don't want to create a competitor to what we just bought. So let's think of a different thing to do. Now, the important thing is, is like, even at that point, there were, originally there were plans to sort of combine the things. But the key point was, is we need Citrix Zen Server as, a, as the vendor of Citrix Zen Server to work really well with OpenStack. Um, certainly, there were lots of predictions at the time of we need to make sure, you know, OpenStack isn't a reason to move away from Zen. If you're invested in Zen, invested in Zen Server, OpenStack should be the perfect choice for you. Um, at the time, well, still today, the Zen Server pools are quite small. And using it's a really good fit for using a sort of cloudy kind of world. So I was focusing on this. I always remember sort of my first design summits. Crazy scary. I was in the room with lots of these people who'd known each other. And it's like, how do I? contribute here. And I was lucky to have mentors who sort of brought me in and said, hey, you should go meet these people and get to introduce them. You get to get that face-to-face -face contact. And you start to get pulled into the conversations. And that was a kind of really interesting experience as you kind of onboard in the design summits. And I remember sort of switching between, oh, no, there's this Cinder session. It's talking about Zen server specific volumes. Better run over here. And then there's this Nova thing over here. Better run over here. Um, fun times. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> anyway, so talking to the summit with lots of people, there's these Rackspace folks building this huge cloud, and I thought, well, it'd kind of be kind of fun to work on a massive cloud. Um, so I moved over to Rackspace and was working. The main change was the focus in the compute section. So I work on the in the compute part of the public cloud team. As part of that, I discovered. Um, the wondrous nature of code reviews and how actually useful they are to actually start to understand the system. Um, it's genuinely true. Like doing code reviews, and you get to see what other, co you know, what all the other reviewers are saying about well, not not your code, but the other code that you're reviewing. And you go plus one, this is great. Minus one, there's this massive problem that breaks the whole world. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Like there were lots of sort of aha moments as you sort of learn through this whole process. Over time, I sort of started to look into helping out with the Nova Drivers team, looking at blueprints and design reviews, mostly because of 
sort of getting involved in the design summits, it just sort of spilled out from that. Um, eventually, I became the release CPL, which isn't a strange kind of robot. The CPL is the cross-project liaison for the release team. So I was looking at what blueprints land where. Or do we actually have any blueprints that are finished? You know, what's the state of them? Helping coordinate all that stuff. And uh, yeah, in the beginning of the Liberty Cycle, I became the Nova PTL and got all sorts of more kind of fun seeing. So sort of, it's an interesting journey from being a packager of the system, being a vendor, making sure that my product as a vendor worked, and sort of being on the other side, which is an awful phrase to use, but sort of going from you know sort of leading the project, talking to all these different people in different ways. So one of the questions that I often get is, you're called at John the Tuba guy, do you actually play the tuba? Um, no one really believes me. It was very expensive to stage this photo. No, uh, so this is, this is me with my quintet. Um, I'm me playing the tuba um, with Corona Brass. So if there's anyone in the Cambridge area in the UK that needs a brass quintet, hopefully someone once on the video, once it's recorded, would, might actually do that. Do get in contact. We do weddings and all sorts of things. I mean, if you pay for the travel, we'd probably come over here, you know. <laughs> anyway. So for those of you who pick sessions by the title, this slide doesn't make any sense. For those of you who either read the description are probably just as confused. But what I wanted to add in here was a literary reference. Um, my partner, Sally, she does sort of English and is really interested in English literature and runs book groups. So I wanted to have a nod in her direction by saying I'm going to reference this literary text. I say, I was talking to this with Sally and she said, oh, that's your favorite book. I said, yes, it's the only book I've actually probably read from the beginning to the end and really enjoyed it. <laughs> I actually studied it, but it's, um, we'll get back to that. So I wanted to start by thinking about what, what do we want the OpenStack community to be? And as a community, we've been quite explicit about that. We want to be an open community. There's lots of details and definitions about what this open means. Um, there's open source. It's not open core. The whole thing is open source, Apache license. There's open design. You know, We have design summits. We have open development, open roadmaps. Everything's open. It's a great, you know, we want a vibrant community of users and developers all working together. And anyone can come and join in. And we strive really hard for this. And you'll see if you read the mailing list and everything else, we're really, we really, really appreciate where we're pulled up, where we're falling short on these things. So where we can do better and better and better at being more and more open. And this is like a key goal. So when I was researching this, apart from the fact a picture of an elephant's kind of cool, um, I came across this story of three blind people meeting an elephant. Some of you will know this very well. Um, it was relatively new to me, actually. So the first person comes up, and they get hold of the, uh, the leg of the elephant, and go, well, this is a, a crazy-feeling tree trunk. That's kind of interesting. Um, the other person gets hold of the ear, and it's like, well, this leathery, kind of flappy thing. That's confusing. And someone else said, well, there's this massive fire hose with teeth. Um, that's interesting. It's even more interesting. Um, and, well, they're kind of all correct, right? But it can cause an argument. So they go away, they sit down, they go to a bar and have a drink together. They're chatting about this thing that they saw in the woods. And, you know, no, 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 it's definitely like sort of this shape. No, no, it's definitely like this. If you've been to a design summit, you could call the elephant all sorts of things. You could call it a problem. Lots of people seeing different parts of the problem. Like one of the great things is where you have all the three people get together and describe all these different pieces, and you get a much better understanding of the whole. And it's really, it's, it's really rewarding as a developer when you actually see that happen. You're like, I didn't think about that. That's super interesting. And you get all these different pieces fit together, and you get a much better solution that doesn't lock you into a particular mindset. Or it, It's kind of where the, the anti-lock-in really comes in. 
it's more about thinking about the whole when you're starting to put stuff in. And I could talk about hours for that, so I'm going to stop. So another thing I came across when looking at this is this ladder of inference. It's kind of lots of words on a slide. But the, the basic idea, and this is my bad interpreted philosophy that seems to just make my point. But So th there's an awful lot of data in the whole world. And as human beings, we naturally filter that down to a very kind of small set of data. So yeah, we filter this down. You add in your assumptions of the world, and you come up with conclusions. That gives you a sort of set of belief systems. And based on all this stuff, you decide what you're going to do. And the other piece is that like your beliefs and everything else also tend to influence the uh, data that you select. And there's kind of like a cycle where you, you can get like bubbles of knowledge where people have shared context. So you have two different groups of shared context. And they can be, in order to get people to work together, you have to look at like what's behind that and understand your shared context. Let's make this a little bit more real. There's an interesting example of someone doing an interview. So you're sat down doing the interview, and the person walks in 10 minutes late. You have a chat, everything else. They seem OK. They go away. And you're like, why on earth did they come 10 minutes late? Clearly, they just like don't care. They turn up late everywhere. That's super annoying. Um, well, given the data you have, that's a reasonable conclusion to come to. What you didn't know is that they were rushing from the hospital at the other side of town. They gave an hour. They get stuck in 17 traffic jams, and they just forgot to tell you about that because they're embarrassed. And it's interesting how you can easily get the wrong end of the stick, or at least that's a phrase from where I come from. Um, and I just like how this particular description kind of describes that scenario. People are people. It's not that it's easy to get into these nasty situations. One thing that I often get asked about, particularly more being PTL, is why does the core team seem quite cliquey? Now, the real, the real answer is, is the core team and all the different sort of levels and different teams are really trying to be open. That's why I started with the openness. They're not attempting to be this, but you do have teams that are quite highly gelled that have been together for several years with an awful lot of shared context. And as a community, we have to work hard to make it really easy to gain that context. We have to be able to mentor people and reach out and pull people in. And it's really... It's hard work, and we have to keep doing that and have to keep striving for it. But um, this is all about you know, pulling everyone together. So I've been talking lots of theoretical things. Um, I'm a technical guy, so I thought I'll draw some diagrams to try and describe this world. So there's lots of ways you can view like the set of problems that OpenStack is trying to solve. but. Let's say I simplify it to a red circle, because that's really nice. Um, it has great properties. It's like beautiful. It's round. It's a nice shape. It seems perfect. It's a low energy state. Everyone loves it. So it's like this perfect view of the end mission. So it was the Nova PTL. You know, I've got my view of the Nova project sort of like 10 years' time, what I'd love it to be, and it looks like that. Bear with me. It makes some more sense in a minute. <laughs> Today, what would I say Nova looks like? Well, it's a little bit like this, right? So that's not going to work on a screen, is it? Never mind. So there's a hole in the middle. There's bits that are in our vision, but just haven't been implemented yet. We really want to fill that hole badly, because it would make it much, much prettier, a bit more like the red circle. There's a whole lid of that gum around the outside, that sort of slightly darker red bit. Um, this little bit at the bottom we might have deprecated. This other bit we sort of forgot to deprecate, but people are using it. These are things that like the project, it's in the project, it's kind of being used, but it doesn't really fit in with the mission, and we kind of need to find a way of fixing it. So now let's have a look at like the internal view of the mission, like with my internal hat on, how I see the project looking. It's very easy to sort of think, well, it's you know, slightly smaller scope, kind of looks like this rounded square. It's also pretty, it's also beautiful but it's completely different to what the other people are thinking. And that can cause, you know, that's like this, I'm trying to visualize the mismatch of the context. So at the beginning, I said I was going to talk about getting my idea upstream. So what's my idea? I love my idea. It's fantastic. It sits there. It's perfectly in the mission. 
So I work away, I implement it, then someone says, you know you have to get that upstream, right? Oh, uh, yeah, oops. Um, I should probably go talk to those folks. So you upload your code for review, and the people reviewing your code kind of view your solution a little bit differently, maybe? So sometimes it can feel, it, it can look a little bit like this. So there's this bit at the bottom over here, super excited about this piece here. You're filling, one of my, you're filling one of the gaps that we've been looking for for ages, and that's the most amazing thing we've seen for a long time. So people get really excited about that, but it doesn't solve your problem. You want all these bits around the edges that kind of are in scope. You're depending on something that Nova is trying to deprecate. You're maybe re-implementing something that's already in the project, and that's kind of causes friction. So this is where I insert the random literary reference. Not really random. So I think the key to actually resolving this is about empathy. I like this quote. Um, it, it, the idea is, right, you don't really understand the person. Until you look at their point of view, you walk around in their, you climb into their skin, get in their boots, and walk around in them. You know, that sort of idea of visualizing what the other side thinks. Now, this is a two-way process. The people reviewing your code need to understand where you're coming from and vice versa, right? It's a two-way street. You need empathy definitely on both sides. So let's get back to the problem in hand. So I wanted to take a slight deeper dive into this diagram and talk about some of the outcomes of discussions about this squiggly cloud thing. So one thing that sometimes happens is, right, you come with your solution, and people go, not really sure what you're trying to do here. So after some discussions, you get actually down to what the real problem is you're trying to solve. And the answer can sometimes be really exciting. Good news. We already have tested that and created it for you, and it's over here. Um, so you, one reaction is, sorted. Use it, sit down. Um, the, the extra piece I'd like to add is, well, you probably, well, maybe didn't read the docs. But, yeah. um, but it would be really good if you could actually help other people find that too. Because clearly, when we wrote the docs and understood everything, we didn't get your point of view correctly and didn't communicate that well. So that's a failure, and that should, there's still stuff to do even if you find your problem solved. Another thing is you go, yeah, I've got this idea, I've got this you know, solution. Uh, well, actually, this guy over here is already working on it. Or, you know, Mel over here is busy working on this. Can you help? And my request at that point is very often, can you help review it? Like even if you can't split that work up into pieces, just help review it. Make sure it does actually solve your problem. Test it out. And that that can be a great thing. One thing that does happen sometimes is you go, hmm, there's a tick on this hypervisor support matrix. That means I can use this crazy live migrate thing. That sounds awesome. Uh, you set it up, and OK, so maybe it doesn't quite work as you expected in your particular configuration. Now, that's great data. We may not even realize this, or there may be 17 bugs in Launchpad already saying this, but getting people together that actually have the same problem, get together and work together to fix that, that would be awesome. Um, so let's look at making sure that the red is actually red. It's not just a sort of weird beigey color. OK, I'm stretching that way too much. So what's the other case is, oh, yeah, that's that, that's that whitey, bluey bit over there. That's the piece that we've been looking for for ages. So yeah, I mean, let's try add that. That would be awesome. There is another piece, which is you talk about the problem, and then you end up saying, Hey, maybe this is out of scope. Maybe, maybe you're building on something that we really want to try and move away, and there's problems, and well, yeah, but it's trickier, right? Let's get to that. So what if your idea is out of scope? Well, let's, just to reiterate the point, first discuss your problem, and then talk about the solution. It's really easy to sort of get Maybe this is particularly as a developer, but it's really easy to start talking about, I've got this amazing solution. I know if I do this, this, and this, everything's fixed. The world's is, is amazing. And that might well be true, but 
I think the key thing is, is if you get people, if you start talking about the problem, you start building that empathy. People start to understand the problems that you're seeing in production. They start to realize why your users are not adopting this particular piece because of this, this, and this not quite fitting together as it should be. And then what they do is actually sometimes very exciting. Believe it or not, the person goes, oh, that's kind of an interesting problem. Now, well, I think you do this, this, and this. And you start collaborating with all the different people because you build that empathy. Um, and very often you find it's just not out. It isn't out of scope after all. The solution may have been out of scope, but your problem had a different solution, maybe bang in scope and maybe exactly what we've been looking for. Or it might be that we have to expand the circle with a big marker pen around the outside because you realize actually <laughs> we need to expand the scope here. There's all sorts of different answers, but fixating on the problem it really helps. So there is another option, which is, OK, so it's not, at, it's not in scope. This project's got way too big. We just can't scale it. We need to create something else. Um, it turns out this is actually very effective. This is where the heat project came from. Heat, the people in the Nova project saying, hey, we've got these groups of VMs, and we need to orchestrate all this beautiful stuff. And Nova's like, that's a really good idea. But we're trying to fix this thing over here, and it's really hard. <laughs> Um, so it's kind of like, uh, and we don't want to stop you, and we're like, we can't really help you, we think, we don't know, <laughs> don't talk to me. <laughs> um, so it, 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 in that world, they created a whole new community, and they sort of started working on this and attacking the, attacking the problem themselves, and they came up with a fantastic thing. So the fact it's out of scope can be the best thing that's ever happened to your problem. It's not a negative thing in many, many, many cases. There's an interesting case that's happened recently, which is this concept of instance server HA in Nova. So the, the idea is um, you monitor and you hug a VM and make sure that if it goes away, you notice really quickly and do something about it. This is one of those orchestration pieces that inside Nova, we're just trying to fix the, the, the stable APIs and make it work. But when talking to the people who wanted this instance HA thing, they're like, well, we've got half of this solution that kind of monitors these pieces and can do all this stuff, but we're missing like this primitive and like these little tiny primitives. If you could just add these things in, we can do our thing outside of Nova and we're really happy. Very often the project will go, actually, we need those APIs anyway. Like that's just something we forgot to do. It's in one of those holes. So work together, add that in, and you still, you get your, you get your project running and, and steaming ahead. So I've talked a lot. Um, I wanted to get down to sort of like, where do I start? I'm possibly maybe lying because of the next slide. And you go, ah, yes, I'll go find out about the process. Um, so I'm, o I'm perfectly allowed to take the mick of this diagram because I wrote it. Um, it's not as complicated as it looks, but I would say that because I wrote it. Then the next reaction is this one, um, which is my reaction when I saw the diagram after I finished it the day later. <laughs> um, and the next reaction that follows on from that is, okay, so I'll just do it internally then, never mind a... I don't think this is the right solution, but I want to work with this solution for a second. So first of all, if you have internal patches, there's people upstream still writing code, regardless of what you do about it. And even if you try and do some of your patches upstream and some downstream, you end up having this bifurcated development process. That's cost number one. I'm not going to count the costs as well, you any of them. Um, so just going through this, let's do the thought experiment. I say it's a thought experiment. This is something we have to do for a, a case I'll get to. So you, you, you've got this set of patches. You create an internal patch because something's on fire over here. You need to fix it. You need to get that in production. But you've got your patch upstream getting reviewed. So you kind of have this like parallel process. You have the thing working here, but no, we can't wait for that to merge. So we'll get this done fixed here. That means like every time you try and deploy, you need to take all the stuff from upstream, merge it with what you have, Retest it, because you just invalidated all the testing everyone's been doing really well. And then you have to add, you, then you suddenly think, well, I need to add a feature on top of that thing I just added. And 
oh dear, and that has to go in the internal patches and it all snowballs and gets a bit of a disaster. I referenced Ply here as an aside. I'm not going to go through what Ply does. It just turns out to be a really useful tool if you have a very small patch queue. Um, one of the things we had with a big team is if you have to rebase and then force your branch, it turns out two people force the branch together at the same time. It doesn't go very well. Then you lose patches. Um, so it turns out this is an interesting tool to like just keep a set of patch files and then merge them with upstream and other bits and pieces. It, the larger that stream of things are, the, the bigger the snowball of problems. So I want to talk about OpenStack process. This could be a double session talk. <laughs> um, and for that, it could be interesting. And I realized this writing the slides that I probably should have also put that one in, but never mind. The first piece is the process is designed to help you. You may not feel like that, but it really is designed to help you. I'd ask that you always ask this question, why? Like, If you want to like understand the process, ask why people will answer that. In Nova, I've tried to make an effort of like creating FAQs and writing it down. The reason is people ask you on the IRC, and I can now give them a URL rather than having to type it out every time because I'm lazy. Yeah. Someone show me that trick. It's kind of handy. So the first piece is idea feedback, really. When you look at the process, there's an awful lot of informal and formal processes all about like talking to people, understanding your idea, understanding the problem you're trying to solve. There's the ML, there's IRC. IRC is old school, but with a bouncer and everything else, it really does work, and people really have great conversations on there. Honestly, if you haven't tried it, definitely do. There's some ML summaries that people are starting to produce that are going to help people keep in sync with what's going on. The, Developer mailing list, definitely look out for those. If you look for the weekly summary email, it's actually right in there right now. I think it's getting split out, but anyway, yada yada. The other piece is specs and blueprints. This process isn't as scary as it seems. It's all about making sure that we understand the problem and we document the problems we're fixing. Blueprints are really about telling people, hey, we added this feature, it's in here, here's links to the docs, you probably wanna, and it's just a way of tracking things. The other thing I want to mention is the design summit. It's, it's hard to underestimate how useful being at a design summit is for a developer. Getting that face time with the people who are going to review your code, you have a face to that person who just gave you a minus one. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you, or you can create a prettier voodoo doll, I mean, whatever. Um, the, the key thing about the summit is it's, it's where people talk and get to talk. And the, Lots of the processes you look at, like the six monthly cycle, uh, it's kind of influenced by travel budgets. So it's basically, you know, you can, you can realize that getting to pick the people every six months is a bit of a stretch anyway for most people's travel budgets. But we sort of work around this like six monthly getting all the, <coughs> as many people as possible all together every six months. So you have this kind of regular sync and you can, Get all your frustrations out the system face to you know face to face. It, it's super useful for resolving conflict. I said I'd be brief, and I'm failing miserably. And so, I wanted to very quickly cover the types of Git commits that are generally in, imported. Um, I could go on about this forever, but generally you've got feature things, which are often tracked by blueprint specs or specless blueprints or an etherpad, or it varies by project. And then you have bug fixes, very often using Launchpad. And then there's stuff that isn't either of those, isn't marked as those. But that's kind of a general thing. When you think about which bit of the process do I fit into, that's the main three points. Is it, is it a feature, is it a bug, or is it an other? The others are quite slow to get reviews. I'd make it one of the other ones. That's just my tip. The other piece is talking about code review and spec review. Garrett is kind of the lifeblood of the OpenStack community, honestly. The review systems and everything else, um, they really do help people collaborate and record the collaboration. And the asynchronous collaboration would be basically impossible without this. I live in the UK and work with people across the world, and I'm very, very grateful that this is here. If it wasn't here, I couldn't get to the tube rehearsals with my quintet, and that would be a disaster. 
but she just play awfully. But it's really important. The other thing I wanted to bring out is testing. Another lifeblood is the testing, making sure that every patch actually works. Going back to my original experience, I remember pulling down the OpenStack code before they had a gate. <laughs> yeah, too painful. Um, so one topic I was going to cover is why all the deadlines in Nova. I never really found a good way of describing this data. Um, talking with people anecdotally in sort of my team or other teams, I realized that there was this... It, people didn't realize quite the scale of some of these problems that we have. I would love lots more reviewers. I would love... Yeah, lots more reviewers. I won't say it again. I don't mean core reviewers, I mean lots of reviewers. Like, the more people we can have helping with all the things that we need to review would be absolutely fantastic. During the Liberty Cycle, I noticed that we got over 100 approved blueprints, bearing in mind that the design review of those, like, each, like the initial review usually takes me half an hour of a spec, pretty much, and you need two core reviewers to do that. Um, and the, the amount of effort going in to get to that level is kind of crazy. We actually got 60 of them merged. There's about 400 bug fixes. The scale is pretty huge. So the deadlines, really my sort of punchline was the deadlines turn out to be mostly crowd control. And it's kind of like we need to stop thinking about this thing here so we can actually do the code reviews here. and need to stop thinking about that kind of code review so we can do the priorities things here. I won't go into this for too much detail, but that's the kind of general summary there. I think the key takeaway from all this, there's lots of numbers. There's usually a reason why people do the things that they do. The process is there for a reason. We're always open to changing the process. We probably change it too much. Um, but do engage in the debate. Um, and do, hel you know, do help us like, with ideas and stuff that really welcome. So I wanted to cover a piece on the level of involvement that you have as a contributor and what that what that actually affects. So one type of contributor is the one-off contributor. There's a quick doc fix, there's a big quick bug update update and there's oh, I need this flag here because it's really important to change this value. Why did the hell did you hard code that? Um, they generally may not have met anyone face to face, but these contributions are truly, truly valuable to the community. Like one of the, I think, my memory tells me that one of the reasons we chose Python was to enable these kind of one-off contributions because it lowers the bar to entry. They they are really important. They are costly for us, but they're super important and are the lifeblood of the community. It's important, but when you're doing these one-off contributions, you only have a certain scope of the context, so you have to kind of learn the context within your contribution during that phase and that. That can be sometimes be a lot of work. Sometimes it's almost zero work because you have better context than the person reviewing it. But it depends on exactly what you're doing. Other end of the spectrum, there's the regular contributor. They're sort of bought into the mission. They're on the IRC all the time. Really all the time in some cases. I don't know how they do that. Um, they read the ML lists, go to IRC meetings. They've got all this information coming in. They've absorbed it. They've dropped half of it on the floor, but then they absorb it again. And, you know, that they're sort of bought in, and when they create a patch and when they're doing the reviews and everything else, they have like a lower overhead to try and gain that context of what they need on that particular piece that they're doing. Because they've already spent all this time gaining the context on all these different places. Um, no one really actually understands the whole of Nova. That's just a. I pretend to. Um, well, actually, I don't. I tell you who knows. But it's there's a different cost there. Then there's a sort of infrequent contributor, which is sometimes, sometimes honestly can be the hardest because of the moving context. Upstream runs really fast. So you kind of have to regain the context when you come back. And there's kind of a phrase that I sort of came up with. I don't know if I came up with that. I probably heard someone else say it. Anyway, so this idea of community debt, like when you've gone away and come back again, there's, you have to sort of regain this context and this kind of community debt thing. If you have gone away like halfway through a project and left something unfinished, then people go, oh, I wonder if you do that next time. And this is like kind of debt and 
trust building exercise. Again, that's probably a whole talk, but I just wanted to nod in that general direction. Okay, so I'll try and finish up with a few thoughts, like how do we how do we all get forward? Like the how does the community move forward on this? How do all the contributors, you know, get to a better experience? I it's definitely it's definitely work on both sides. So one thing I wanted to talk about is a book that I read. Okay, so I did read another book. I lied. Um, so th there was this book called Gung Ho. Um, I'm a very cynical developer, I suspect, being a developer type person. I don't like frameworks that tell me what I'm meant to do, but this one describes things in an interesting way, so I like it. Maybe I should be more cynical about myself. Anyway, so the starting piece is the spirit of the squirrel. The squirrel thinks, I need to get nuts, otherwise I'm going to you know, perish in the winter. It's really worthwhile work. You know, They want to concentrate on getting the nuts. So this is about getting people bought into the mission and understanding why they're doing it. You know, what they're doing is really important. The next piece is spirit of the beaver, where the beaver knows that it needs to stop the dam from leaking. If the dam starts leaking, the whole thing falls down. They're not telling people what size twigs to use. Clearly, someone had a huge log. Um, but it's kind of everyone's kind of working. You got to get people in control of achieving the goal. This is more about being clear about you know sharing the context and giving people the rules of the game. The final piece, which is really quite important, is the gift of the goose. And this is where, like, if you see geese flying, apparently they're encouraging each other on. They're like, we'll make it to the migration, we'll keep going. And they keep switching, and it's all this encouragement. And that's really important as, a, as, a, as the project and all the contributors, we have to sort of encourage each other on. So this is actually what I'm trying to do right now with the Nova project, why we're trying to get people aligned on the mission, like bits with the product working group and everything else. It's all about getting this gel team. So I'll finish with some top tips. Going back to this problem first, solution second. I think that's <laughs> it's a corny thing to say, but it's so it it's so so helped me over the years to try and win people over. It's kind of developer marketing in a way. It's get people bought into your problem, get to agree the problem, understand the scope. It's super useful. Ask why and debate, don't shout. Keep asking why, learning more, and you know, actually debate. And the more you get involved, the more fun I've had. That's my experience. Um, so if you fancy getting more involved, I'd recommend it. I was going to finish with this quote. I think all of this, a lot of this boils down to empathy. So everyone understanding each other better and taking time to make that understanding on both sides. I really do believe that. Anyway, I want to thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I hope it really helps you on your journey with through OpenStack. Um, thank you very much for your time. And if I think uh, we might have a few seconds for questions, if there's any particular questions. If not, I can talk to people afterwards. Thank you very much.